get back It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm especially excited. Today, we have Lee Bellinger. He's founder of IndependentLivingNews.com, which has a private subscription, and they have tons of products for off-the-grid living, survival in an emergency, gaining independent income, and much more. Basically, they teach people to take control of their lives. Uh, He's an inventor of Power Whisperer Home Power Backup System, which we'll talk about and how he created it, the research done behind it. Independent living is noted for its successful predictions. And Lee, this was amazing. In February 1998, Lee published a front page illustrated prediction story on the destruction of the World Trade Center by terrorists, which we'll talk about how he knew that. He has been recognized by the White House for his work in state legislature and is a hero among his subscribers. Lee, thanks for joining me. Hi, Jeremy. It's great to be here. Thanks for that great introduction. Yeah, this is going to be fun. Um, and, you know, we're in the Titans group together with Brian Kurtz, which we'll talk about. But, you know, I always like to include a fun fact. And a fun fact about you, which your wife would say is strange about you, is you read five to six newspapers a day. Yeah, I do. So what's, your morning, what's your morning routine look like? Oh, I'll, I'll try to get up as early as I possibly can. Mm. And I like to read the Investor Business Daily and uh, – uh, the uh, the John, uh, London Journal and I, I read uh, I read the Wall Street Journal and I love to, uh, like to read the New York Times. Uh, some of my my readers might be surprised about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know just different different newspapers, Investors Business Daily, uh, the Times of London. I said that. So yeah, you know it's uh, th- these are all things where you get a sense of fluidity about current events. If you, yeah. if you read a newspaper uh, long enough, if you read them pretty much every day, yeah. the stories start to take on. A, f- a fluidity and there's even a predictive piece yeah. of it where you can say with reasonable certainty that this is going to this is going to come to fruition in yeah. a few months and you kind of see it peeking out behind the headlines yeah. and, and I, you know, of course I watch some of the news channels I watch around on the news channels and uh, read books like anybody else but uh, and, and specialty publications but it's my wife thinks it's a little bit uh, she's, uh, she thinks I've taken geekdom to a new level uh, so so will you wake up at like 4 a.m., 5 a.m.? How long does it take? I get up, uh, you know, it's about a three-hour, it's a three-hour slog. But, I mean, that's yeah. when my brain is the freshest. So, so like I, five to up. eight, you could be. I'll be, yeah, it's, uh, I'll get up, I'll literally, I'll get up, sometimes I'll get up, at, I'll get up at five and I'll work until about nine and then I have breakfast and I actually go back to sleep for a little while uh, to let my, I'm really good at uh, taking cat naps. I've You're been good morning. at it ever since I've been in college. Uh, I can do that. I can sleep anywhere, practically anywhere. Yeah, so. I want to talk about your predictions, Lee, and first off, Obviously, how did you know in February 1998 when you published that? What was going through your head about the World Trade Center? People thought I was an alarmist, but um, I, I remember d- telling people, I said, this, this, the, the, the. well, first it had been attacked already. So, really? you know, and, and that's the thing with these attacks, they tend to have a. Uh, a pattern where they're, you know, and I, and I would, I was just mentioning one of the reasons I'm big on talking about the threats to the power grid because there have been some mock attacks on the power grid, just like the World Trade Center. It's one of the things mm-hmm. that concerns me a lot. But the World Trade Center, in particular, uh, was uh, I had been reading about, you know, the rising escalation of terrorism, yeah. uh, and and the fact that they had been attacked. They tried to topple the tower, and it's such an irresistible landmark. Uh, it 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 was very troubling to me. Uh, my specific prediction was a nuclear attack or a, a semi-nuclear attack. I didn't predict the airplane yeah. piece of it, yeah. but I actually did the pictures of the World Trade Centers being destroyed. And uh, is it probably, on one of those pictures behind you? What is behind you there? 
Uh, it's uh, those are the those are manuals and s- oh, things okay. that I produce. I produce like I produced about 160 manuals and white papers yeah. on everything from reclaiming your privacy uh, to how to hire and fire and manage lawyers yeah. uh, for for business people and uh, just a lot of other. I have yeah. uh, probably my uh, ultimate guide to self reliant living, which basically teaches you how to shape the landscape of your life so that it's optimal for you. Yeah. Uh, and and so that you can you know uh, have you know a much uh, less uh, less a lot less stress in your life by covering basic things that that make you actually marginally better safer. And, what was uh, on the cover of that? So you said on the cover of that issue was yeah. the World Trade Center, and it yes yes it was, and I also um, on page two it was all original artwork. Uh, on page yeah. two, um, I I also sketched out the probable attack on the Capitol that might parallel it. Well, really? the third the third plane that I think it was the Shanks well, the the plane that went down in Pennsylvania yeah. uh, apparently was headed um, for the Capitol. So weird. I mean, it was strange. I, I you know when I saw it happening, I was like going, oh my god! So this is how it's going to happen. Wow. Uh, and I was a little relieved that it was a non nuclear attack. I knew yeah. it would be a limited number of people at least. Mm. And Why did you think that? Besides, the, was there anything else besides the previous attack on the World Trade Center that made you predict this? Well, it's it's a little like Pearl Harbor. You know, we knew America was going to be hit. We just didn't know where. Yeah, it was very clear that the uh, the rise of a terrorist with global reach. You know, they had uh, in 1998, uh, the Clinton administration had attacked in three different locations around the globe, trying to trying to uh, tamp it down but you know the cold uss coal and just other events warning signs leading up to the final you know end game with yeah. the world trade center yeah and uh you know so and and then the other thing about it was was uh you know essentially we were wide open to a uh, uh to a border infiltration operation which is exactly what 9-11 was so you know, it was it was just one of those things, yeah, Jeremy. Where, that's you know, crazy. We were, unfortunately, we were, we were you were right recent. on that. Yeah. yeah, very unfortunately, it was uh, it was very it was very stressful for me, and I was I was very distressed about it. I, I how was it received I, when you put that on the the cover originally? Oh, people thought I was an alarmist. Uh, people thought that uh, you know this is the only happens in Hollywood. It sure looked like a Hollywood production, didn't it? Uh, yeah. Except it was real and. I was like, I, I just, uh, you know, th- there were other experts, there were real experts that were predicting it was a matter of yeah. when. I was quoting a lot of experts, but I, it really proves a point that I like to make to people is that yeah. you can't look to politics to protect you. Um, you know, I did 20 years, I published the American Sentinel, which did nothing but talk about politics and complain about politics. Yeah. And I reached a point of critical mass where I said, you know what, I don't care about politics I care about people taking charge of their lives and preparing themselves yeah. for what's going to come around the bend. So I'm kind of a post-political person. I was oh, very ridiculously opinionated on all this. Now, now I'm like um, I kind of look at all the political people yeah. largely the same. You were really um, opinionated on politics, you mean? Was yeah, you know, but I kind of got it out of my system. I mean, it's what drew me to political stuff to begin with and reporting. So of course I had a, a passion for it. But over time, I'm going like, no, no, personal self reliance, post politic. There's nothing wrong with voting right. Voting for freedom is always a good idea, and I tell that to my readers. But the first step is to take charge of your little corner of the mm-hmm. world, because the more people that do that, it spreads. It gets yeah. it gets bigger. And that's where the real hope for the country comes in, yeah. uh, not in not in political change, because you just yeah. see the same parade of people. It's different faces, but it's all this. It's always the same eddies, currents, and backwater. Every once in a while, you'll see a a political person who's you know a step above or a grade above, but it's not the norm. You yeah. know, it's not. Yeah. It's it, the government cannot be proactive. That's the real lesson of terrorism, is that it can't be proactive. It always responds yeah. to the last thing that happened. Uh, yeah. Government is not designed to to act. No matter how much evidence there is that something terrible is going to happen, it has to happen first. It right. has to have. It's like it's like airplane safety. Nobody ever dies on a plane in vain ever, but they never fix the problems in advance. They wait until there's several mishaps, right. and then when there's a body count, that's it's when in they business make. too, right? There's a you know in Less the manual, in a rule gets gets written in because someone 
you know. Well, not not necessarily. Like, uh, did you catch that thing with the TSA? The TSA doesn't have the ability to expand uh, the amount of service it's got. Mm-mm. But like the airlines have a surge capability. When they get busy, they know they're going to get busy and they plan for it. But yeah. the but the TSA, even though they know they know that there's going to be more people in the summertime, mm. they don't scale up for it. So guess what? The airlines are actually coming over and providing the scale up. So they're helping people un- undo their bags. And so the airlines are pitching in to help this government run agency that can't do anything proactively. Yeah. Not even, and I mean, at Christmas time, FedEx knows that they're going to have more uh, deliveries. So they right. scale up. So why wouldn't the TSA scale up when they realize it's a great example, though, of how they cannot do anything proactively. And when people count on that, they're counting, whether it's for retirement or anything else, it's their own ruination. So I just tell people, right. become more self-reliant, but in a smart way. Not that skinhead stuff that people teach. I'm ta- I don't, not living in a bunker in the woods. I mean, I'm a rocks in the scotch kind of guy. And I like modern conveniences. I really like modern conveniences. And I like good living. And I, I like to teach people how to do that the smart way. Yeah. Not all that dumb stuff about hiding in a bunker. Uh, so that's what yeah. I, I mean, if you if that's, someone that's watches, that's what makes me different than, than yeah. a lot of these uh, uh, people that uh, just don't they they want to tell people oh live in a bunker and do this and you know uh, you know get ready to shoot your neighbor and no 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 you don't do that uh, it, it's it's much more positive and proactive yeah it's more about preparation. Yeah, that's yeah. the one power you've got is you can say this is going to be an issue or a problem. I'm going to take advantage of it, and I'm going to be, you know, it's not just a matter of being safer. It's also yeah. being able to take advantage of things that are going to happen in the future that you know are going to happen because it just it's inevitable. Yeah, I mean, I think I got that sense because when I watched the video for the Power Whisper Home Power Backup System, it wasn't just about like if something goes down, but in the video it was interesting. It shows people camping and just enjoying like coffee or something that you can plug electricity into. And it's also so, tailgating it, too. <laughs> right. So, so, so you know, I was like, oh, like I had no desire to buy one. And, and then I watched it. I'm like, huh, maybe I need one of these things. <laughs> you know, so. Right. And it's a great backup. It's, it's right. a great backup. And you, 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 you know, it's just uh, the grid itself has got a lot of problems. It got nationalized in the 90s. And. You know, all these infrastructure issues, Jeremy, uh, that, that basically when a country is this far in debt, uh, it's out of sight, out of mind until it breaks. And that's the power grid. That's the water grid. Mm-hmm. It's uh, basically we live in an age of dysfunction. Yeah. And so I teach people how to make their own world functional yeah. or I try to. So the ups, that that's the big surprise. Uh, you, you know, you were wondering about what surprises me the most and what was my biggest surprise. But when I lived on that yacht for five years off the record, too, is her name. And I lived up off in the Capitol record, Hill. Your, the yacht off the record, the That was the name of her. Yeah, off the record. Um, <laughs> I actually had you a little were in politics at the time. Oh yeah, and I I used that boat a lot. I um, what I did was I it's a, it was she was a beautiful fifty two footer, and I made her available um, for political fundraising. So I ended up with a lot of political people borrowing my boat. Uh, I never charged any money for it, but I kind of got a kick out of seeing the political people up close. But I you know I had Boehner on the boat. I had, you know, I've had a lot of uh, Speaker Boehner. I've, uh, he was the majority. He was the majority leader then, uh, and things of that nature. And you know, all these people on the boat, and I just uh, Tom Delay even, and I just I had a lot of fun uh, 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 running it up and down the river, down uh, down to Fort Washington and back, and little cocktail cruise. And it was much better than having a K Street office. All these people spend a fortune on these boring, stuffy K Street offices. Well, you know, what do you want to do? K Street office or an evening, uh, Potomac evening cruise? Well, you know, it wasn't rocket science. So I got to, you know, it was just a great way for me to uh, kind of stay looped in with the political people and to yeah. observe them. And uh, what's really surprising the most is that uh, high-end people in McLean, which is a very high-end uh, district uh, part of the D.C. Uh, it's in Virginia, but it's like suburb of D.C., yeah. an elite suburb. Uh, and they're all buying emergency generators and food. And uh, and, and this is, a, a, you know, even people that were working at Homeland Security were buying generators. And I, a friend of mine at the Yacht Club was installing them for a living, and he, he, he couldn't get enough time to do all. Really? So – uh, that's kind of got my attention that that high level people, uh, you know, uh, in the United States government don't even trust the provisions that are made for that's the rest a sign of the sign on the wall. 
yeah. yeah. And then I said, oh, gosh, this is interesting. And I kind of saw that uh, the survival business really was like dominated by people. I just did, you know, I didn't, I wouldn't want living next to me. They were just, I, I They're said, more this extreme is, or why? Yeah, I thought some of them were extreme and they just were people that weren't doing it for the right reasons. I still think they had the right idea, just not the way they did it. Yeah. So we went, yeah. I want to go back, Lee, to where this all came from, and I'm curious where you grew up and who was a big influence for you when you were growing up. Oh, I, I was born in Syracuse, New York. Uh, hmm. My dad my dad was in construction. He died uh, in a freak accident in 1967, really? and my uncle was down in Charlotte. Oh, my God. And my family migrated to Charlotte, North Carolina in 1969, and... Uh, yeah. And I've been there. Uh, my family is still there. And I went to D.C. Uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I probably spent half my professional adult life in D.C. and toggling mm-hmm. between there and Charlotte. So, so how uh, long were you in Syracuse? In Syracuse area? I, I moved when I was ten. So, oh. no, that was 1969. Yeah. So, traumatic. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. But you know, that's what. But you know, now, now I'm in. Now we're in Charlotte, and my family is alive and whole, and uh, it's great. And so we're. When you were growing up, Lee, what did you want to be? I never thought about it, honestly. You didn't think about it. What were never. you thinking about when you were young? Uh, you know, I, pretty much everything I've gotten into is by accident anyway. I mean, just yeah. I just kind of go in the direction. I mean, of were you into, like, politics then? Were you into sports then? I was, I was into politics, yeah. You were, even at a young age. I, for, yeah, I, I always liked politics. My mother kind of got me going on that, so, yeah. Hmm. It was... Uh, and then, you know, I went to Hillsdale College in South Central Michigan. Right. And had, That's, I was reading the, that, and that seemed random to me. Uh, well, what happened was uh, my mom kind of got me hooked on it, and she said go up to this little seminar they had mm. over the summer, and, and they made an offer for me to go to the school. And I had, you know, mm. and so I ended up going to Hillsdale, and then I joined the Washington Hillsdale internship program. And from there, I got an internship in Congressman Dan Coates' office, who was a freshman, and I ended up landing a job as a legislative aide, and that, so I ended up getting credentialed as a Hill staffer. Uh, and so Hillsdale did a hell of a lot for me. It was really, it was great, wow. uh, great, great thing for me. I was very fortunate. And then um, once I, I worked in a couple of congressional offices, and then and then ultimately I I went into doing activism, and then ultimately and after that finally into publishing. Yeah. So that's that's what. So happened. you were right into politics right after college, though. Pretty much. So yeah. what was the most I guess uh, craziest thing you saw being in politics for twenty years. Um, I don't even I don't even know where to start on that. <laughs> uh, at the Capitol Yacht Club where I was, because you're uh, like on the inside here, so was like, let's just say that 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 um, I let's I, talk I, about off. The, I mean, you're both called off, off the, record. the record. Yeah, so, by the way, dinghy, I'm sure you name of the stuff. dinghy. If you wanted, it was, the name of the dinghy was called on the record. So. <laughs> If you wanted to be on the record, you could sit in the little dinghy on the back of the boat and go in the water, but that was it. That's so hilarious. I had a little plaque that just said, everything on this boat is off the record. I, probably the reason people trusted me in politics yeah. was because I knew how to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. And I saw plenty of things that, that uh, you know, I saw, I, you know, I just saw a lot of things that, that uh, you know, you just, in a marina, when you live in a, in a marina, you learn to look the other way. No matter what you so, see, you know you have to give me an example of something you can say that's not. Uh, there's a let's put it this way: there was a member of Congress in the Senate who got busted for some embarrassing stuff in a in a bathroom, and and you know just there, there was a lot of indicators that this individual just there was a lot of stuff that just you know the post would come over looking for him and trying to find him at strange hours and you know just things like that just just odd. Uh, circumstantial things, but um, I was on the uh, admissions committee for the yacht club, and one of the guys uh, one time one time they it was uh, they were trying to get Ted Stevens in back into the club who'd let his uh, membership expire, and he was like considered kind of a, an old corrupt Republican. He since died in an airplane crash, and oh. there was a interior uh, secretary and another senator trying to get him back in, and I'm on this committee, and I'm like, oh, what the heck? Oh my God! This is this is like, it was just crazy. So, uh, in 1987, Lee, you were honored by the White House. What well, happened a, with that? I got, what I did. I I was running something called the Coalition Against Nuclear Annihilation. Yeah. We took there was something called the Freeze Movement, which basically said we should freeze the level of weapons, uh, basically 
we freeze the level of nuclear weapons where they are. Well, yeah. at that time, the Soviets had a numerical advantage, and they were passing freeze resolutions in state legislatures. So I literally took their language and applied it to missile defense and called it the peace shield. And I got pro peace shield resolutions passed in different state legislatures, including mm. um, And so these were basically pro missile defense resolutions that were based on freeze language uh, that the left had originally done. But I simply took it and turned the language, their language, into pro missile defense language. Mm. And ultimately, Reagan got the uh, missiles pulled out of uh, the, the intermediate missiles pulled out. He, they eliminated an entire class instead of freezing them in place. So, uh, but I, I got these resolutions passed. And so, um, the, I got a, I got a call from the White House Office of Public Liaison and said, the president's sending me a letter, hmm. um, which was a very sweet letter and, uh, mentioned our private conversation we'd had, uh, we'd, we'd met, I met him at some, uh, event, uh, in DC and, uh, for whatever reason we started talking. Well, what's cool hmm. is when you're talking to a president, uh, nobody interrupts until he is done. Mm. Uh, so what did you talk about? For like three minutes, I was telling him about my coalition against nuclear annihilation, yeah. and then um, when and apparently uh, a, a month or two later, I got this uh, call, and they oh, said wow. that uh, this letter is coming for you, and uh, and and that's how it happened. So it was really it was very cool, but I operated as kind of an outside operator. Uh, uh, you know, on that on that particular issue for them, because there weren't a lot of people that, that had any ideas about missile defense. Then in 1983, when that stuff was introduced, it was like, you know, a strange idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's not something that, you know, now now you've got different countries with uh, with these missile defense systems. Uh, and, and so it's it's actually been accepted. But at first it was quite controversial. Right. Right. So. What got you into the publishing world? Like everything you're describing, I see you just continuing in, in government. What, uh, where did publishing come in? I was uh, working for a newsletter called uh, American Sentinel. Mm. And um, basically, Jeremy, I got a... Uh, what were you doing for them? I was, I was, a, I was a freelance writer. Mm. And I did it freelance for three years. And then on the third year, I went to hit the boss up for a raise. And instead of raising my pay, he had a plan for me to buy it. Really? And I bought it. And so uh, I was very... What did he it. see? Like you obviously went in for a raise and he saw something in you at the time. He didn't want the newsletter anymore. But I mean, it was... He didn't uh, want it. No, it was. Uh, he had. This is like the Phillips Publishing newsletter right. empire. So there were. It's a big newsletter. It was, it, and now it is. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and it became Independent Living about uh, ten years ago. Okay, but it was originally American Sentinel, and then I changed the name and focus on to make it more about self reliance. Yeah, it still covers a lot of political stuff. I cover political yeah. stuff, but yeah. it's it's uh, generic. It's not. It's not like I'm doing, you know, I think I think Matt Drudge does such a fine job and others do such a fine job of the political stuff. Uh, there, there was just no need for me to continue doing it. But I, I give my analysis to people uh, of, of financial issues and national security issues yeah. and other things based on my understanding of politics. So I do have that going for me. You know, if you yeah. understand politics, you, there's a lot of things you can predict safely. Yeah. Yeah. Politics is relatively predictable once you understand how it works. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, if, you, re if you read six newspapers a day every day, then it becomes, <laughs> it becomes predictable. I, I was caught off guard by the Donald Trump thing. I didn't catch that. I didn't see that one coming, um, and I didn't even take it seriously at first. Uh, so, it, but not, but it didn't take me long to catch on that he was on to uh, on to a, a better path than people realized he would be uh, initially. Yeah. So, you know. And then I realized what I said. Oh my gosh! Okay, well this this is this is going to work for him. So uh, you walk in to ask for a raise, and then your boss says what to you? He says, "Have you ever thought about becoming a publisher?" And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, we've got a plan for you, Lee. Uh, we we think you could publish this, and uh, we'll assign you a person to teach you the business." And they did. They taught me a fellow named Richard Stanton Jones, who's passed away. Very very mm -hmm. generous uh, people. And, uh, you know, it took me and, you know, within a few months I was publishing the newsletter and, and, uh, I've been doing that ever since without, uh, without stopping. So early on in the American Sentinel days, what did you do to help grow the, I mean, so your job is you have other writers too at the time, or was it just you? That time it was all me. It was all you. 
It still is, you know, it's still mostly all me in independent. You're guiding it, yeah. I had like, but I would do, I would try to come up with innovative stories. Yeah. Um, One of, one of them. What was a blockbuster? Yeah, early on. um, I did a story about the Soviets shipping um, Chernobyl design reactors to Cuba. They were called VVER-440s, okay? And these are graphite-moderated reactors that can produce fissionable material and power all at the same time. And so I called every single environmental group, who are very leftist, by the way, and asked them about their concerns about this VVER-440 Chernobyl design tube reactor uh, uh, being installed 90 miles away from the U.S. Where it, when it's sitting right you know, on the waterline meaning if you have a meltdown, you're going to have a radioactive cloud of you know, steam coming right. into half the United States. Right, and right. so I called every single environmental group, and they refused to comment on it. They're really? worried about hugely safe American reactors. But I even, I even did a graphic of, of the kill zone of these VVER Chernobyl reactors. Wow. How did that even come on your radar? To even I talk about it, that, I read it somewhere. I read it somewhere, yeah. and then, and then um, I, 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 the, the Cubans have a paper called Grandma, which is the official state newspaper in Cuba or was yeah. at the time. I think it still exists. Yeah. And uh, once that, and it was, they were bragging about it. And then I said, "Wait a minute, what is this design?" And I said, "These are the, this is the Chernobyl design, here next to our country." Uh, and the environmentalists, uh, the Sierra Club, and they said, "Well, this is like you know Cuba," and they were they were more interested in defending socialist Cuba than they were in mm. actual genuine. And these mm. are people that had shot their mouths off mm. against American nuclear yeah, why weapons, is that? which are incredibly because they're left wingers, and it proved that they oh, were left wingers. I gotcha. So then the other, the other that, that their agenda was political. Their agenda was political is what I was trying to show. Mm. But then I did another one in 1993. I did something called the Sandernista Voting Index, which basically, because Bernie Sanders was honest enough to say he's uh, a socialist, I did a voting index of 21 votes and compared how all the members of Congress voted, how often they voted with a pro-socialist guy yeah. on all kinds of issues. And so um, there were a lot of people that had voted pro-socialist. And uh, so I and, – and here and, it, and here we are, you know, 20 years later, over 20 years later, and now um, uh, Bernie has surprised everybody. But uh, that was probably my earliest prediction mm. that, that I, I basically said socialism on the ascendancy in America, and I can prove it because look how many Republicans and Democrats are voting pro-socialist on key issues yeah. by comparing how they voted with avowed socialist Bernie Sanders. So you do a, a ton of research, Lee. What does it take, like, for you to do an article, to start an article and finish it? How long does it take, and what what research do you? What's your process for the research? The, the research just happens – basically you train your mind when you spot an article that reveals something key. So mm. it's kind of like – think about it this way. Think about it like an airline pilot yeah. that does a takeoff. Like what's a future landing. article going to be about? Like right now, what's on your radar? Uh, future articles. Like uh, one that you just – you maybe have seen in the past week or two that you're like, this is going to be a future – a topic for the future. Um, I I follow I, I definitely follow what happens with the uh, power grid. Yeah, very very worried about that. And so um, there's a number of probable scenarios that I think are going to happen. Yeah, because there's been in San Jose, the Silicon Valley, uh, two years ago there was a a mock attack. Uh, basically, a bunch of gunmen showed up, shot up, shot up and near the transformers and. Uh, and they melted back into the population. We don't know who they were. Nothing ever came of it. Nobody. Mm. No, and and it was a clear test. But the thing about electricity is it cascades. You got these really old transformers, most of which are at the end of their service life. They're very hard to replace. And if you notice, if you look carefully when you drive around in your own community all over America, you'll see these above ground power grids. Right. Uh, they're they're completely uh, vulnerable. Uh, and somebody's going to strike them. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, and when they do, it takes months, if not years, to replace these transformers. They're really, really old. So no no upgrade. Uh, that, that is a big worry I've got about the power grid because yeah. you could have a What's the biggest company. concern, yeah, for, for that happening? Let's say it does happen. What's the biggest concern for people and you? Well, the first 
the first thing is is uh, most power power shortages, power outages are local events usually. Uh, what would happen if it was regional? What if they took out most of the southeast uh, by by attacking 40 locations at once? Well, nobody would really know because electricity has a cascading effect. It's not always easy to predict how it goes up and down, up and down lines. And so you could have a situation where there's no electricity for quite a long time. Uh, three or four days in, people are going to start getting really desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do the same thing could happen with an EMP attack, which, you know, I was really glad to see that in the presidential debates this year, that, you know, the possibility of a satellite based electromagnetic pulse weapon very primitive weapon could take out and fry most of our electronics in the United States. We're so dependent on that stuff right now. Hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how well the country would, you know, respond. It, it really would be an unknown. Uh, it would be a big unknown, but, you know, yeah. without refrigeration for, remember the food supply chain is three days long. So at minimum, you're going to have great financial disruption if, if not, you know, uh, a lot of other disruptions. So uh, I just society is very dependent on the technology working perfectly. Yeah. At what point did you decide I need to create this power whisper? Because that's where the power whisper comes into play, right? Yes. Because, yeah. I, well, it wasn't just the grid, but I went I went to a couple of shows and I bought several several uh, solar generators. Yeah. And I just thought they stunk. I remember I was saying about the survival market. I yeah. was like these are people that don't use these yeah. devices. Yeah. What's I, bad you know, about it? What was bad about it? Uh, the best selling one that I could find uh, had 17 physical fuses in it that had to be replaced about half of which would have had to been replaced by a technician. Mm. So physical fuses, and they didn't even provide the extra fuses for the party. So you're in the middle of nowhere. But most of them were cosmetically very attractive and very underperforming. And people don't use them until there's an emergency that may not know that's an issue type of thing. Exactly, the, and they they were they were they were just very very underpowered. They you know it was clearly that they were designed by people who never used them. Yeah. But see, when I when I build something, I actually utilize it. Yeah test it i use it and you know like with the power whisper uh we've done like 14 major um upgrades and that's why i insisted on building them here in the united states fabricating them here in the united states not all the parts yeah. are u.s parts yeah. i couldn't do that um yeah what's the process look like so you have this idea for this because you're really good from idea to actually executing and coming out with it um and i don't know if you're going to mention what you're working on now but uh, but um the power whisper i mean did you? The, what was the first thing you did? Did you sketch this out? Did you meet with a certain individual who helped? Yeah. You know? Well, the first thing I did was I met with people who are supposed experts in solar power, and mm. it, I discovered that it was pretty much a politically created industry, and therefore it had attracted a lot of charlatans because that's what that's what political money does, and so there were a lot of big talkers. I see. And so people were trying to get the money that. Because people are paying were, for solar angling, power things, right? Yeah. Solar, solar, solar. So they're all angling for the. They're all angling for uh, you know business people angling for. And I was watching, and the guys that were selling this stuff were guys that 25 years ago had been selling you know uh, insurance, and they knew nothing of, of of this stuff. And so I discovered that I had to kind of do the ground zero research. So I just that's what I did. I just did ground zero research yeah. and I determined where all these other so we yeah, we we put in resettable fuses. I was the first one to do that. Um I built it out of aluminum, uh aluminum 5052 aluminum uh, so that it would be EMP resistant. And I and I'm probably one of the few people that makes solar generators that doesn't trust solar power, so I created three <laughs> different ways to charge it. Hey, I noticed three that. different ways to charge it. Yeah, you it. could plug it in in the video, you could plug yeah, it in so, the solar so, power. That's so funny. I created I just, a solar generator this, that I don't trust solar power. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and so I I I came up with, uh, with different ways to charge it for I people. wonder why you did that. Yeah. And I I mean, but I was skeptical of solar energy and I said, yeah. but this this could be perfected and made into something that's actually actually reliable yeah. and uh, that's how I that's so I look for the flaws in the in the system mm -hmm. and and uh, and I and I say can I make this actually a yeah. real generator I've sold several thousand of them they're yeah. they're uh, really great it's this is tough I mean this is a hardcore physical product that you created yeah I made it what I was the biggest challenge 
I had never been involved in manufacturing, so supply yeah. chain management, cash flow management. Um, you know, here I go from publisher. People thought I was nuts. What are you doing making a solar generator? And I said, I, I would do it for – by the way, and you could get I, – I actually yeah. share all of the components of how I build the thing. So you don't have to buy them from me. What My readers like mm. me because I actually show them how to build it themselves. Yeah. And I give them the basic parts list and say, this is how you do it. And I yeah. produce the video. And everything I everything I sell, I teach people how to build on their own. Yeah. So long as they have it. Makes Why it do you, what makes you do that? Uh, that would because, be the opposite of mo- most people's mentality. You know? Well, because, because uh, most people are going to want the finished product. Yeah. And they also appreciate the fact that you respect them enough to show them how to do it if they wanted to get together and do it. And right, I do that right. with every hard product I've got because yeah. it's also a social stability issue. If more people get together and do this themselves, yeah. it's just overall better. So what do I care if a few retirees get together who are uh, uh, engineers and decide to build a couple right. power Right. I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. Yeah, and I saw there's a couple different versions. What's the difference? There's a standard one and there's a pro one, right? Yeah, the pro one is based on the most – it's an industrial-grade machine. It'll run a small window air conditioner, for example. Uh, my brother used it, and it's all on the, it's all on the new lithium adva- – highly advanced lithium batteries. Yeah. Uh, and it's got it's, – it's also got a uh, – pure sine wave inverters so it's uh, smart appliance friendly yeah there's a lot of uh, uh they're starting to put chips in appliances now so they can be controlled by the smart grid and conventional solar generators or conventional generators won't run those devices so the pure sine wave inverter lets you basically run everything including smart appliances so yeah. i'm constantly making upgrades but that's the real advantage of building in the usa because because you can make upgrades as they but like I said, 14 upgrades to the Power Whisperer, many of which are suggestions cut that come from my subscribers or from people, uh, even the staff. Yeah. Uh, you know, we get the idea, you know, and, and we just, you know, we put it into the next generation. So yeah. we added an adaptive power pack and an extra solar panel for people that wanted to double the capacity of the Power Whisperer because yeah. it's it's designed so that you can actually upgrade it. It's not like uh, these uh, uh, cheap, uh, uh, have you, I don't know if you bought a vacuum cleaner lately, but if you do, uh, at Walmart they break inside of a few months. Yeah. I got sick of I got sick of all that stuff breaking, so I you know I made it military durable. You know yeah. I said I'm going to make this military durable, and I want it to be completely portable. It's got hmm. roll up solar panels that are not quite as good as the uh, heavy uh, crystalline uh, panels, but it's something you can actually transport and take yeah. with you, take it to a second home, and um, with the advanced, uh, and I really keep up with the advanced battery technology because it's roughly doubling in improvement every year. I don't wow. know, probably too young to remember, but you know, calculators used to cost thousands of dollars. Right, yeah, yeah. In, in calculators, and then they got better and cheaper as they went. And that's what's happening with it's not happening fast right. enough, but it's starting to happen. Yeah, battery. same thing with computer chips or whatever, you know. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's um, right. so, so what's the most, Lee, what's the most popular product right now? By far the Power Whisperer. It I, is. The other one is my ultimate guide to self-reliant living, which is kind of my Boy Scout manual for adults, uh, and it's how I. It's it's, is that the I, Mega Manual one? The uh, ultimate. Mega, yeah, the ultimate guide to self-reliant living. Yep. Yeah, I need to ask you about that because sure. the cover. Tell me about the inspiration of the cover. So, I mean, I can't show it to you, but if you could just go the, on, uh, people can the, go on Independent Living. News.com. Oh, is this, is this guy in the hazmat suit with the, uh, yes. with the golf club? Yeah, so people can go on independentlivingnews.com backslash shop. And I know you do everything methodically and carefully. So I, I have this up on my other computer screen right here because I'm going to ask I was going to ask about it anyways. Just being funny. And, I had this wild and, idea. Okay. Right? Let me just describe it for people has- before you – yeah, describe it to people. Describe <laughs> the cover to people because – it's the ultimate guide to self-reliance living, and it, it it's got a guy making a stroke, a golf stroke, in a hazmat suit, and right. it's just, and it, the ball is going off, and the ball is I just. I didn't know what to make of it. Yeah, and like it's it's uh, it was really there was no sinister message. It was designed to be funny. It's it was a little designed bit, to be funny, really. It was designed to be funny. I thought yeah. there was some no a whole not. story behind it. No, I wish there were a better story than just to say I was trying to be funny, but it just made me laugh when I thought about it. And I had this weird image in my head, so I said, I'm putting it up on this thing. So why it, do you it, think that one's a bestseller? 
for you? It's representative of pretty much the best of the best of what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as far as it, it basically it's a shows, manual though, right? It's a manual, yeah. right? It's not a book. It's like, it's, it's all hands on practical advice on techniques and tactics I've personally developed, yeah. uh, like for how to function in the barter economy. Uh, not that you, not to get out of taxes like some people want to do, but you could use it for that, but it's all, it's just to be able to function and, and, and yeah. make money go further. Yeah. yeah so what else take, is in there that people love? Not, not to be taken advantage of by insurance companies and, and how to, and, and, uh, uh, you know, basically, do you think, have a, do you have it handy for or around you or no? I don't have it. Oh, you don't. Okay. Reach, reach of me, but I'll, okay. I'll be glad to send it to you. Yeah. Uh, no, I just want you to hold it up. So people I don't, can see no, it. I don't have that handy. Um, but it's uh, it's very popular and it's 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 pretty much how to on everything imaginable, uh, your privacy. I, I mean, I've got a manual on privacy that goes much deeper, but it it, it teaches you like, like what yeah. fifty things you can do to be less conspicuous than everybody else. Like what? Uh, true Let's... privacy is illegal. Oh gosh, everything. Because this is this is the talk for people, right? Because people are saying, you know, they can read our, you know, the government can see our emails or phone calls or whatever. I don't know how much this is true and how much of it is not when I hear these things. But. Well, if you're a person of interest, they can pretty much dissect your life. But the the issue really is not. Uh, I mean, for, real privacy is truly illegal. It's not legal anymore. However, uh, you can you can be less attention getting than 99% of everybody else. And it could range from Jeremy. It could be like, uh, uh, uh how you, uh, don't do the home office deduction this way. And, uh, you know, if you, if you run a little business out of your house, uh, here's how you can, uh, here's how you can get your food tax free. Uh, make your, make your, get food, uh, basically free, hmm. uh, your emergency food free by just taking advantage of, of the fact that, uh, gains in food are not taxable, hmm. uh, and, and things like that and use your business and, you know, get, get water, get a water machine set up in your house, uh, as part of your home business. And all of a sudden your water needs are covered and it's tax advantage. So tax advantaged food, tax advantage, this, yeah. um, I teach people, I teach people how to get, um, first class medical attention and not be treated like a number. And, and basically my argument is, is I, I say, look, uh, you need an advocate in the medical system as much as you need one in the legal system. Yeah, true. And uh, sure. something happens, uh, you know, so I teach people how to you get tax advantage dollars uh, to uh, get far superior medical care than you, most people are getting right yeah, now. So yeah. A lot of very practical, hands-on uh, uh, deep issue stuff where you can you reconfigure your finances and your personal life. So you armor your life without actually living inside of a bunker Yeah, by just, just systematically improving your overall efficiency and how you're, 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 you're more private. You're, you're less interesting to officialdom. Uh, you're less interesting to lawsuit happy jerks. You're less, you're just less interesting. You know how to set up trusts that are actually smart. None of this phony baloney stuff. And I warn people away from doing anything illegal or improper. Um, I don't believe in cutting corners. I believe in complying with the law and the spirit of the law. And I, I, I teach people to operate. And you actually are much better off that way than trying to get around yeah, it. Yeah. A lot of the survival people will teach people try to get around the law. Uh, I never, never recommend that because yeah. you don't ever want to be in a position where you have to worry about things. Yeah. You know, Lee, you know, I could see the power whisper. I can see from back in the day when you were living on the yacht and you saw all these people getting these backup generators and seeing that trend in yeah. your audience. Um, so I, that's that seemed like uh, evolution. Not that it's obvious that you would actually go into manufacturing hard goods, but an obvious thought process. I'm curious of one that – and that worked well uh, for you and your, and your customers. What's one that you thought would work well that – <laughs> didn't get the reception that you you believed i uh i have had a few white elephants that okay. i created uh one of them was something called the sun uh which was a smaller version of the power whisper but the battery technology wasn't where it needed to be at the mm. time it was too early and it was too early yeah so so that was kind of because i know like we learn a lot from the some of the things that don't work as well yeah probably the best the best flame out i've ever had yeah. uh in, I, I was doing a direct mail piece, and this is this is like my very first direct mail piece, okay? Yeah. 
and this was in the night this was mid 1980s yeah. uh, and 1986 to be precise and so uh, I did a big mail piece on how uh, Libya was a rising terrorist threat and that we should push for sanctions well about a week after that mailing hit, Reagan bombed Libya. So here I am calling for these wimpy sanctions, which when I originally called for them, that was considered the hardline position. And then Reagan bombed Libya, made me look like, oh, gosh, he's calling for sanctions. Reagan bombed him. And so that mailing bombed, too. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, so sometimes sometimes, uh, sometimes an actual event can undercut what you're uh, – usually it's, the uh, – That's tough with politics, though, isn't it? I mean, being in well, – but, but often, like – uh, when I do make predictions, generally there are a lot of confirming events leading up. Right. So that that usually works in my favor, but that one didn't. That was like yeah. my first big prediction, and yeah. and, and uh, I was not correct. So what's a direct mail campaign that did work really well? I have one now called, uh, that 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 features the uh, ultimate guide to self reliant living, and it's uh, you know I mail. I'm mailing about three quarters of a million of those a year, wow. uh, telling people about my company and inviting them to become, you know, subscribers and so on. And, yeah. and a lot of people take me up on it. So I tell, yeah, it tells a little bit about my story. It tells about my predictions, and I, you know, it's it's not on. It, it's uh, you know, but I I just tell people, look, I've been I've been publishing for 30 years. Uh, that's my biggest credential, probably. Yeah. You know, because the internet has not here. taken me out. You know, it's Let's see not, if you yeah. can see this. I don't know. But that's you it. Can see that right here. And we have um, this. Yep. I don't know if you can see that. If people are watching the video, there's uh, the newsletter and some really uh, cool information here. Um, and the other, the other thing I get to do that's really good, great, Jeremy, that I yeah. love doing is uh, I'm helping people over 50 to uh, uh, find businesses that and new streams of revenue that they can mm. create for themselves without the internet. Really? Uh, like and, what? And what's uh, what's something you talk you, about? You can actually do. You can actually believe it or not. You can do a little mail order business, and you can start it with very little capital. And mm. I've got people like Doberman Dan, and I've got uh, people doing little columns for me that uh, kind of educate people, my friends at the American Writers and Artists Institute uh, down in Florida, and, you know, just, just some other very fine uh, organizations that, that uh, teach people how to uh, become more self-reliant in terms of their revenue, because a lot of people uh, are a little worried about, uh, you know, do they have enough retirement money? Yeah. And Here's how to set up a business, and you know, and some of them are, are are some of them are great for people that have grandkids or kids that that don't have jobs or they're yeah. unemployed, and they can start little businesses for themselves. And so, uh, for so people I'm, who don't know what that is, what it, explain that mail order business? Let's just say you, you know got we're some, talking physical mail, like people are like, what's that? That's right. <laughs> but it, well, no, but it's yeah. it's it's very lucrative. You put yeah. a you put an ad in local papers and you sell something like. Uh, it could be a fitness article, or you say you write a little report on on your fitness secrets. Yeah. Um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger started with those types of things in comic books at the beginning, but yeah. long before he ever got yeah. noted for anything. And if you look at the history of these, yeah. uh, so a lot of people start with these little these yeah. little rinky dink businesses, but they lead to bigger things. Yeah. Like, what have you found? You know, it's interesting because I just interviewed someone. He's got. Um, the, the one of the founders of ABC Vacuum, and that's how they started the business. Is they would put, a, um, take an ad out in like a magazine or newspaper, put a little ad in it, and they'd for vacuum cleaners. And people would reply. They'd have catchy headlines, and people would reply and buy vacuum cleaners from the newspaper. Yeah, or, 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 let's say you've got a pet peeve about your broker not doing a good job. Well, here, uh, yeah. Here's Lee Bellinger's 17 rules mm. for never getting messed up by a broker ever again. Yeah. And you sell it and you, you know, and then uh, once once you've got that person on your mailing list, you can you can get other things of value from other people, make deals with them and yeah. sell that to your list for a fraction of the cost and so there, there's a lot of things that a private individual can do right. uh, if they're willing to, you know, base, the biggest thing is, is that you got to be willing to uh, continue to educate yourself and invest heavily in yourself. Yeah. And, uh, and I think a lot of people over 50 are looking to reinvent themselves. Uh, I know that that's, you know, we, I think, I think you have to reinvent yourself in life to stay fresh yeah. and to, you know, and, and not go too far into a comfort zone before it's your time. Yeah, uh, and and work outside your comfort zone. Yeah, what's um uh, a 
good way that you can talk about for growing American Sentinel? What worked for growing American Sentinel for you? The best thing to do is is to st- to to create as much mail as you can and and uh, talk to as many people as you can about and of course if you add value uh, to people's lives that's really you know profit is nothing but value yeah you've added to people's lives and so if I if I solve a problem for my family uh, what, no matter what that problem is I write about it yeah I make that. I make that part of it. So being genuine is very important in, in this business. Yeah. And um, I have a lot of very fine competitors, but a lot of them are fictitious. They're, they're, there's some very good they're people anonymous. in the business. They're, 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 yeah, and I'm actually willing to talk about my personal experiences. Uh, one, one invention I'm working on now is, yeah. a, water, is, a, is a very advanced water purification system that, that takes metals, leads, and everything else out, and it does 200 yeah. gallons a day. It's an industrial grade unit called the Thunder Blue. It's still under development, yeah. but I'm going to go drink out of. Uh, we're, we're actually identifying an EPA contamination site where there's water, and I'm going to drink right out of that contamination site um, to show people that I'm. So this is to, the last time you're going to see. Le- no, I'm just kidding. I, I hope not. <laughs> I'm always willing to. I'm willing to risk my wife first. I'll, so I'll start it with her. But if she's if she's okay after that, um, Donna. If Donna's okay after that, then I might be willing to risk my dog and finally. <laughs> no. no, but I mean seriously, if you want to, if you wanna, if you want to um, uh, be a real person in your field, uh, and so um, that's something I'm going to step up and do. If I'm going to invent it, and and. Uh, I've got a great engineering team. I don't really yeah. invent them. I mean, what gave you the idea to even do that? That is a great question. There's a there's a group that's been selling a very and if I mention, I'm not going to mention it because they're really nice people. But, okay. Yeah. But but when the drought in California happened, uh, they simply could not increase. I wanted to become a distributor for them. But they had so many bottlenecks because they were in China having everything built, and so they got bottlenecked, and they couldn't change their products. And mm. so uh, they they actually had owned that owned that field for a long time. And I, I liked the survival straws and some of the other little things I yeah, saw. Yeah. But I those, wanted to yeah. create, and they're great. There's there's some good products, but I wanted to create something for matriarchs, patriarchs, and upscale homes, people with motor homes, and people you know. And that way, you can go and drink the water wherever yeah. you are so how would it work like if someone got it they get it for their home or how how would they use it yeah, you get it you you could use it for your community it'll produce 200 gallons of water a day uh you know and it's it's uh it's got three small micron filters and a uv light and it's 12 volt and it's solar powered and it's a very high capacity unit and uh it's all custom made here in the united states 12 volt yeah, and uh, then a lot of other, and it's got a, and it's got a, a really sophisticated cleaning, self cleaning feature because a lot of these water purifiers that they've got don't have a, a purge system that that, uh, you know, in other words, you you get your fresh water, and then all of a sudden the the bacteria colonate in inside the machine. So this has got a flushing system and right. a lot of right. sophisticated um, features that nobody else has ever thought of doing. Right. So it, it that's took, why they say sometimes filters are the the bacteria and stuff builds up in there, right? And it could exactly. Yeah. And I I solved that, though, but everything that was on the market, you have to get rid of it. You have to throw the filters out. Yeah, and that's no good. I mean, in the end, you need to be able to clean the machine. So it's got an internal purging cleaning mm-hmm. system that works anywhere in yeah. the field. How long does it take to do? You think to finalize? Oh, I'll, I'll be launching it soon. Really? Yeah, I'm, I mean, the prototype's oh. been built. And test it. We use so we test it with these various labs and everything. Yeah. Uh, and so, so like before and after, I'm, I'm, like I, water. I mean, I'm going to be doing the. I'm going to film. I'm going to video the ta- uh, me doing the uh, uh, the EPA site. But we got to find one that's accessible. And I'll I'll be drinking out of a mud hole too. But I already drank out of Lake Wiley uh, using the thing. So, so literally, so it's like a, a glass <laughs> of muck mud, and then after it flows through, it's clear water. Yeah, right? it's, it's a semi-miraculous because it can turn wine into water, and I'll demonstrate that as well. Really? Yeah, not doesn't. the other way around. It, it will turn water, it'll turn wine into water. <laughs> semi-miraculous, I said, semi-miraculous. Um, the other thing that interested me, Lee, was um, the colloidal silver. You know, like, so I have this here. Um, the colloidal silver is pretty cool. 
um, I was looking on your site because I was there. Are these one of the products on your site was two silver rods, right? Or one set of silver rods. That's right. And I was I did and at first I had no idea what that was, what it was for. Um, and then I watched a video. So talk about colloidal silver for a second. What what made you discover yeah, this and enough uh, to believe in it and have this product? Well, NASA believes in it. Um, yeah. They use silver to purify water and air and spacecraft. Mm. And uh, it it has a lot of medicinal. It has a lot of medical uses. Uh, even uh, one major airline uh, actually puts silver speckles in the uh, in on the uh, trays to because of all the contamination. Really. And uh, wow. here's the thing about silver, though. Uh, silver. They remember the. Have you ever heard about somebody with a silver spoon in their mouth? Well, it used to be that the wealthy would have silver spoons for that very reason. Mm. And uh, because I it didn't was know that. Okay. Uh, well, the thing was. Silver was in wide use right up until the 40s when um, penicillin and, and uh, antibiotics started to, started to happen. Yeah. And so the science stopped on it. So, you know, basically people know that silver um, inhibits uh, bacterial reproduction, yeah. but they're not exactly sure why because nobody ever did the science. That science right, kind of came right. to an end. But uh, I only recommend it for emergency situations. Some people want really? to use it for... Yeah, you. Go Why to not doctor. every day? Because you go to no, you, it's not an elixir of health. It's like oh. people go to their doctor. You go to your doctor. This is in case all of a sudden your doctor's not available. It's yeah. also great for pets, so you can take this and put it on a pet's wound or if you're worried about an infection. Mm. But your first step is always to go to a doctor. I always tell my readers keep right. this in your hip pocket. So if there is a crisis, like uh, if, if something were to take and there's a FEMA set up camps and you don't want to go around a bunch of sick people and you can't get your pharmacist on the phone, you got that colloidal silver machine ready yeah. to go. Yeah. Some people drink them like, you know, like it's an elixir of health. Yeah. It is not designed to be like that. It's, mm. It's a it's a form of antibiotic, but it's not. Because yeah. some I, people do promote it online, or like you know, that, colloidal silver and things like that. That's where I'm. A, that's where I'm different. I tell people to use it as a backup. Yeah. Only. You know, yeah. I'm not telling them. I'm not their doctor. I am not a doctor. I don't tell people right. to. You know, you follow your doctor's advice, but in the event that your family needs this medical attention and yeah. you can't get it, that's when you fall back on colloidal silver, and yeah. that's that's what I recommend. But you know, NASA and uh, you know, it's it's used in a lot of medical stuff. Yeah, uh, silver's silver's great stuff, and and it doesn't it does it's not toxic, and it yeah. doesn't uh, and there's no limit on how much you can have, pretty yeah. much. So. Yeah. Lee, tell me about the decision to go from American Sentinel to IndependentLivingNews.com because that's a huge decision because you were running American Sentinel for a long time. Tell me about that process, what you were thinking at the time. It was just because 24-hour news and things like the Drudge Report did such a fine job of, yeah. of, of bringing news to people. Um, I didn't think there was really a political commentary by itself was adequate. And there was a change in my thinking, too. I just yeah. I got burned out on the political stuff, and I said, I think solutions begin at home. Yeah. And that's when I started to put my creative attention on how do I make my personal life how do I go post politics? I'm not waiting around for these political people to fix things. I'm going to fix stuff in mm. my own life. I'm going to get a better doctor. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get superior insurance. I'm going to get superior. I want to live a superior, better lifestyle while everybody else's lifestyle is declining. Uh, I don't want to wait around for the political people to do something for me. Yeah. It, it, part of it is my distrust of the political system. Um, my understanding yeah. of how, of the limits of the, too many people just yeah. wait around for the political people to do something. Yeah. And when you do that, um, I, you know, it's kind of like uh, some some groups in America that are new to America, they, they jump into the economics and within a generation yeah. they're they're doing well. Others rely on the political system to look after them. And yeah. and that's that, that's a disaster yeah. for those people. Yeah. So it's I mean, um, all that the, makes perfect sense to me, but it's still a big challenge to then that's your mindset. Then you're shifting your whole newsletter and everything to different topics. That's that's a challenge. It was a right? natural segue. It was, it was a natural segue because because it's really basically for me to say to people, do you really trust the political system to help you out? Is it really looking out for you? Mm. I mean, you know, the the people that the people that devised the F, uh, the the uh, uh, 
the TSA, they don't fly, they don't go through those lines. They get waved on through, you know. Um, the people, the people who don't want to fix public schools, send all their kids to private schools. Yeah. I mean, it's a double system. It's a double system, and you know, uh, and 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 I, if I had been uh, the Republicans, or if I'd been running for president, uh, I would recommend that one of these guys say, uh, all federal employees have to be covered by Obamacare, uh, right? Things like that, where then they put the people on an equal footing but until that mm. happens and mm. remember like congress has uh in the house of representatives and in the senate um they're exempt from all labor laws so when they insulate themselves from the people they insulate themselves from the consequences of their bad decisions and mm. it's up to us to do the same thing and that's why when i saw people in, at, at the at the yacht club uh who were high level people that didn't trust the system for them. That was good enough for me. Right. Exactly. And I said, you know what? And I'm going to talk to other people right. that, that might just feel the same way yeah. if they don't have to listen to some skinhead, <laughs> you know, i uh, tell them something that discredits the whole idea of self-reliance in many people's eyes. Yeah. Talk about, you know, obviously when you mail three quarters of a million letters out per year uh, and more just for one campaign, what are some talk about some of the big marketing lessons you've learned throughout the years? You know, um, I write a longer letter to screen people out so that if they have a short attention span or aren't dedicated, uh, they'll throw the letter out. And so the re the end result is I get some very very high quality people that pay attention, that want to learn, that want to teach me. Yeah. That that are that are motivated to change the landscape of their life, and that is a huge privilege to write for them. But yeah. you know, it's a waste for most people. You know, you don't want to try to convince people to change who they are uh, until they're really ready to to make those changes themselves. Yeah. So, uh, you know. So the long letter. What else? What else has worked for your business um, in running the business that's helped grow it? Um. Uh, the best, the best thing I've done is I've scaled back the number of employees and I've joined mastermind groups hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, uh, I'm working with other business owners yeah. who have businesses that are equal to or greater than my own. And, yeah. and I can go talk to them uh, about, about uh, the things that I yeah. don't understand and the frustrations that nobody around me would understand but me. Yeah. And uh, it's a big, it's a big plus for me to know, uh, you know, that I'm not alone in, in, in the struggles to make any business work. Right. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I'm mostly a writer, so I, I didn't cut my teeth in business for real. So yeah. I um, mean, I think you have over several over decades. Time, <laughs> but, but I never actually ran it. You know, I yeah. never ran the day to day. Yeah. Uh, like I do, you know, I'm not that I run it day to day, but I mean, I'm, you know, I'm mostly a writer. That's, that was always the big thing yeah. I've focused on. So, one of those people are I, who I consider my mentor, uh, Brian Kurtz, and I know you're you're very good friends with them. Um, what when did you meet Brian? I want to hear some of the lessons you learned from Brian. Oh, that's a great story. I uh, when I first just before I took over my company from the op, the guy that was operating it for me, uh, there was a two thousand dollar a day seminar up at Boardroom Reports, um, and. Two thousand dollars for a day, and I just thought that was crazy. And so I finally, you know, somebody pressured me into going, and I went up there, and I came back, and several million dollars of revenue came out of that two thousand wow. dollars. And really, and uh, and that's and I started talking to Brian, and then I went the next year. Wait, what did you do? Back up for a second. So John Bensavinga taught about video sales letters. Not Ben Saviga, John uh, John Benson. I'm sorry. John Benson. Okay. And he's a genius at this stuff. And I went back and I revised all my scripts and mm. I revised all my marketing and it all went sh through the roof. Wow. What was through one big takeaway you learned from John Benson? Uh, talk about your uh, talk about your mistakes. Talk about your story in terms of what was the moment that you you know realized that you wanted to make a big change in your life and uh, change your business and uh, you know tell people more about your backstory which i was always reluctant to do hmm. i always was selling my product and not yeah. so much why were you reluctant because i'm sure a lot of people are i think that it's just the way i was raised uh Don, i never was really big on being the center of attention yeah. uh some people are really good at that and then others i uh, kind of you know but it is part of the business picture too you yeah have to, 
people want to know your backstory. They yeah. want to know why you believe what you believe, yeah. uh, not just what you believe. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And so people, you know, you're the pro- obviously the product of your experiences. Yeah. So you met Brian at that conference? I did. And so what happened from there? Um, I got hooked on it. I started, I started, you know, uh, started taking courses. I was always rather insular. I wasn't like, uh, you know, this uh, eager student. And I realized really? that my marketing. You, do, you had, do strike me as an eager student. I am. You. Well, yeah. because I thought, but I was so insulated for many years. I never looked at other people's work. I know I always just did my own thing and yeah. I was more of a hunter gatherer type businessman. Um, and then I, you know, I wanted to do more. So I uh, wanted to take the business to the next level. So I started going to school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and that really was the big moment for me. Uh, and then and I went to the big Titans conference, and uh, you know, and now I'm in the Titans Mastermind group, uh, and it's it's fantastic. And I'll probably join one other one, uh, you know, uh, of copywriters. So yeah, you no, know, I'm I'm just learning. I'm just learning so much uh, it, uh, stuff that I should have learned a long time ago. Yeah. I'd be, you know, better off if I had. So, so, you know, with obviously you've you and Brian have lengthy conversations. What's a, a big takeaway that you remember from from one of those? Oh, you know, Brian is he's always a cheerleader for what you want to do. Yeah. He's also he 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 warns you away from uh, the what's called the shiny object syndrome of distraction. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's always like he asks me the tough questions about my business. Uh, understands the publishing business. Yeah. Uh, if I if I'm having trouble understanding an area where I need a connection in the field, I call him. Uh, generally, I you know I've done very very well through that process. Yeah. And you know he's a very well connected. He's very generous. Yeah. He's very generous, and he's introduced me to a lot of people. Uh, you, you know that it's it's enriched my business life and my yeah. personal life, and so it's it's always it's just a positive thing. You know he's a giver. Yeah, big time. And, and I, I have that philosophy too. I think you cast your bread on the water, you do better. And the readers know that too. You know, if you're if you're too draconian about taking their money without giving them some value and yeah. making them and, and at least giving them the option, uh, you know, I think people really appreciate that. Yeah. So, you know, eighty yeah. percent of what I do is information that's available. Yeah. What's Lee? What's been the most controversial article that you that you've produced that you got a lot of comments or calls on from your oh, that's easy I, I, being from charlotte i predicted that wachovia and the big banks were going to go out of business really and this is like predicting that the you know the hometown football team is going to die <laughs> in a crash or something you know it's, <laughs> it's uh, it and it, it, you know i had i had republican buddies that were saying you know you're being disloyal to the president who at the time was a republican president and you're being against the dollar and you're being a you yeah. know an alarmist and you're not with the, you're not you're not uh, towing the line with the party, you know, the economy's great. And, yeah. you know, and I'm like, no, these, these banks are going to crash. And, and, uh, you know, Wachovia was like a pillar of the, you know, it, it was found, it was a hundred years old. It was a centerpiece of Charlotte. The idea that it would collapse is just, was just unthinkable. And, yeah. uh, so a lot of people were PU'd at me over that. They thought that I was being, uh, they just thought I was like, uh, you know, being down on the dollar and being down on America yeah. and, and uh, you know you are you know why are you helping the other party? And I'm going like you know look I I work for the readers you know it's and so sometimes right. the other one was Y2K uh, that that had all been ginned up and everybody had a almost religious belief that the mm-hmm. economy was going to collapse and uh, a fellow named Dan Pilla had done a lot of research and sold me and he's and he was an IRS expert and he said don't throw all of your IRS files out the IRS computer is not going to melt down they're not right. going to let it happen. And that was another big one where I got in trouble. So do you find when that happens, Lee, does subscriber members go up, down, or stay the same? Does it affect, do you find the more controversial it affects the membership? No, because yeah. the good news about my business is that, like, if they read me, they're going to read Porter Stansberry. They're going to read some of the other very fine publications yeah. out there. And uh, most people that subscribe to independent living subscribe to three or four other things. And so yeah. they will want my take on it. So they, they want a different versus, take. I got you. They want my take. Yeah, it's yeah. not a zero sum game at all. So yeah, there's yeah. a there's a level of collegiality. I just mean like if you like piss someone off, like do they like oh, forget this or are they just used to it in that arena? I think people respect it. Okay. I think people 
I mean, I've had a couple people tell me that I was a useful idiot, and, and uh, you know, and I've been, I've been told that a couple. How times. do you take that? A useful idiot? I laugh. I mean, they're, they're probably right. Funny. My wife certainly might agree. I, mean, I don't know. It's it's. Uh, That's funny. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, you know, I I think that people realize that I, you know, I, I I'm I'm one of these guys. I I'm not uncomfortable with people with different opinions around right, me. Right, so. right, right. Um. You know, Lee, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask about the lowest point and then how you fought through those tough times. I and, had a, uh, in 1993, I, I went into a magazine venture. It was just the technology was just getting there. And I took over this uh, magazine that had failed called New Dimensions. Uh, and I tried to refurb it and it was total amateur hour and I was the biggest amateur of all. And, uh, and uh and what do you mean amateur hour it's just i i tried to take on a magazine i tried to take on a magazine i didn't have the capital i didn't have the know-how i didn't have the i was a newsletter guy okay and it's a different business and so all of a sudden i'm dealing with newsstand stuff and and it was a disaster and i had ignored my core business for like 18 months Hmm. and then in 1993 two days before christmas my house burned down and i was at the worst moment ever holy cow i was burned down uh and my uh so uh, everything everyone was okay i'm assuming everything was fine okay i i got out i actually i my dog made uh headlines uh but he got me out of the fire really uh, yeah my dog bundy and and uh the police were uh, the, the firefighters were giving me oxygen and they they said did we just see that dog leading you out of that house and sure so they called it into the papers Got on Paul Harvey. It got on the front page of the Annapolis paper. It got in wow. the National Enquirer, and it was kind of funny. So the wow. dog got really famous. Um, the National Enquirer. Yeah. Oh, they love stuff like that. They, they, you know, dog saves man at Christmas. You know, uh, rescue dog, and wow. so stuff like that. So that was the low point, and yeah. it took me a couple of years to rebuild my business. So wow. But I never missed an issue. I never missed an issue. Um, I've been publishing continuously since 93. I don't know how I managed it, but I was yeah, really good at cash. It? And I, my brother got me, I mean, I got in a house uh, that my brother had at $300 a month and I lived there for like two years and uh, it just took me a while to rebuild. But, you know, wow. they can't take away what you know. Yeah. Um, you, if you have the knowledge and invest in yourself, um, yeah. you can lose everything and you can still rebuild. Yeah. And that's the great thing to always remember. You know, if you yeah. build, if you invest in yourself, you can always continue doing what you're doing i mean when that's that all happens together that's devastating what do you tell yourself internally at that time are you i'm just curious for you personally what what are you oh, thinking it, it, if i have a marketing package that doesn't work i sulk like achilles in his tent for a day and then i move on and i yeah. i feel that you know I'm, you give I'm, yourself I'm, a day to i give myself a day if it's a really big one i might give myself two days but it's mm-hmm. and uh and then i move on and yeah. i'm like you know it's I'm just, just wondering your process for turning that around because there's a point, even after a day, that's hard. If you, you put a lot of time, energy, effort, money into something or your house burns down, do you have something that you go through in your mind or that you yeah, do to get yourself out of a funk? I visualize where I'm going to be in a couple in a couple of months or yeah. a year or two and just visualize where you're going to be yeah. and remember that, that uh, you know, you know, and try to read stories about adversity, how people come back and I pay attention to that. I, I agree with what Brian Kurtz says about being grateful. Mm. Uh, express a little gratitude, even especially when things are not where they want it, where you want them to be. Right, right. But it is the human condition, and uh, the big thing I've learned is that none of that's unique. We all have the, and you know, it can be small, something inconsequential, and some people have really big problems, and then some people have really small problems. But it is all relative. Right, right. It's all relative, you know. And I, I think that uh, just remembering. Uh, but the other big thing is to visualize your future success and always be forward looking yeah. on, these, on these things. And I also just, you know, get rid of the negative people. That's that's a huge one. Yeah. How do you and do that? And that's not always easy what to do, you, do. Yeah. What do you do for that? Politely, slowly push them away. Um, you can keep one, only one. But, but the people that are negative tend to be, you know, they tend to, to, to rub off on you. So... Uh, just, just don't, just don't hang out with them as much, you know, uh, just, just, just do it politely. There's no reason to be, you know, ugly with people. Just, just, uh, but identify this person is consistently negative and I've got, you know, we only have a certain amount of time to do things and you have, 
you got to stay, I mean, not fake positive, but real positive that you could only get by investing in yourself and knowing that you've got these skills, you know, and it doesn't really matter what the skills are. Everybody's good at something. Yeah. What so, about on the flip side of things, one of the proudest moments in your career? Oh, gosh, lots of them. I, I did a, I took everything I knew and did a wedding proposal. I got married at age 55 and I did a marriage proposal uh, that was a video sales letter. It was a marketing really? that I turned into a cartoon. Is this uh, uh, viewable online or not? Yeah, it is. It is. Is it's it not. really? I'll send you the link. Where? It's. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Oh, okay. But I've got it. I've so got you it. did a marriage proposal video sales letter? Yeah, I did it. Uh, I did it. It was a three minute thing and I did it in a movie theater and it's a cartoon. And your wife now I had no idea. Yeah, Donna, my wife. So she's a hairstylist, so I kept this secret. She thought it was an endorsement of the Power Wisp by actor Gary Sinese. <laughs> so, and so the, the, I went to this elaborate scheme to get. And what so if she was had to go to the bathroom? Like, what would you do? What uh, would you have done? I didn't leave anything to chance. Okay. I mean, I, I spent. It took seventeen people to create this deception, and you know, uh, you can't get anything past a hairstylist because she's a hairstylist. And uh, so I just. Basically, the basically it was a three-minute video, and uh, it, it played during the trailer section of the movie. And she thought she was watch going to see me and Gary Sinese endorsing the Power Whisper. So did you actually, tell her ahead of time, like you have an ad in this? Yes, you, you told uh, she her. She thought of, she oh. thought that it was a Gary Sinese. She was no way she was going to the bathroom. So I and and so I even had her convinced that a limo Gary had sent a limo for us that we had hit it off, and he'd sent a limo for us. <laughs> And so th there was no chance for her to be late. And uh, so she was in there waiting for the Gary Sinese um, thing. And, she, you know, I had her bring her friends and all, you know, so she was all excited. And, and it was a wedding proposal that was a cartoon. Wow. That's amazing. And uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's it's funny. It's about three minutes. It was my first foray into comedy. So it's a 100 percent conversion rate on the on the video. Uh, so, so if you want to no, hire Lee for doing a VSL yeah, proposal, that's right. Proposal, I'm the only guy that's he has 100 percent. So. Of course, it was an rate. audience. It was an audience of one, but it would have been a big awful thing if I hadn't made it work. So it was it was fun. It was uh, it it had a uh, it highlighted a lot of funny things. This is online. Like someone could actually watch this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like if I when I post this. Can when I, I send this to you I'll, when we're off? I'll I'll shoot it to you so you can see it for yourself. Am I allowed to post it below? Oh, yeah, like yeah, in sure. the post. Sure. Okay. Sure. That's amazing, Lee. So, what about um, business wise? What's been what's been a big milestone for you? And proud moment. Uh, the biggest one probably was when I created the Power Whisper because I created a hundred. I created ninety nine prototypes. Wow. And. Um, I sent this out to my list and I sold 628 wow. units thinking I, and I only had, you know, less than a hundred and I expected to sell half of that. Really? So I knocked it way out of the park, uh, not realizing. Yeah. These units are not inexpensive. Either. They, at that time they were 2000 each. Yeah. Now they're, I have them in ranging from 3000 to $6,000 yeah. units, different levels of units. Yeah. A couple of different models, versions. Yeah. Wow. So that was a that was my first truly. I mean, I'd had lots of steady successes, but that was probably the most noteworthy business yeah. success. That was huge. It put me into the manufacturing business right away. <laughs> right. So, and that wow. took that took about a million dollars to master that. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> so, before um, I forget, before I forget, yeah, you said that top three people I want to meet. Yeah. Just in case you got any connections. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Clint Eastwood. Hmm. Okay. Henry Kissinger. And the other one is Marcus Lemonis. Do you know who that is? Of course. One of my favorite TV shows. Yeah, I watch that all the time. Yeah. yeah so uh, any of those three. Would I think be he's from Chicago area, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Clint Eastwood, Henry Kissinger, and Marcus Lemonis. Uh, now, Trump just went to see Kissinger. So, you know, he might have been. He might be. He's 93, so he's he's up there, but he's yeah. doing. It looks like he's. I've, I've read some of his recent articles, and they're pretty darn good. So you are a religious prophet watcher TV show. Um, yeah, I love that show. I think yeah. I think that that uh, going in there and telling owners they have their head up their butt is a great way to great. And yeah, I like Chef Ramsay too for that reason. What do you think Marcus Lemonis would tell you? 
if he came in. Oh, I already know. He'd say, yeah, you're doing this wrong and this wrong, and you need to fix this, and this is awesomely, and this is these work. But I don't know how to scale the Power Whisper. I've only been selling it to my audience. And he said, you don't know how to scale this. And I'm going like, really? You think I don't know that already? Okay. I don't know how to scale <laughs> You've had this <laughs> fictitious conversation. You're already ready for it. I'm going to write so, in the prophet and have him show up at your door. So that guy's cool. I think he's pretty righteous. I like I like him and Chef Ramsey. And sometimes yeah. when I'm at a restaurant, I notice that's had an effect on restaurants. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, Lee, this is fantastic. Um, I really appreciate your time. I have one last question for you, but before I ask, uh, where should we point people towards? Should they go to independentlivingnews.com? Where where else uh, should they find uh, you? They uh, my email address? No, I'm if you want, but yeah, no, no, Lee Bellin, uh, independentlivingnews.com, and and uh, you know in. I'm Lee Dot Bellinger at American Lantern Press. If they want to send an email to any me, particular like. post, they should check out on IndependentLivingNews.com. I that, don't really no. I no? don't no. Okay, I, I would suggest if you check out YouTube, the the video on the on the Power Whisper is really interesting. Um, yes. So okay. I don't know that link name, but if you yeah, um, I mean, I just it, it's on your YouTube channel, so that's how yeah, I found it. YouTube channel. Um, so my last question. Lise, we, you know, we talked a lot about predictions. So yeah. I'm wondering about what your predictions are now, whether it's health or – I know you talked about the grid. Um, yeah. What are some of the big predictions that people should look out for now? Um, I'm predicting – yeah, that's uh, – I'm predicting the collapse of, of – or the great distress of a lot of America's enemies who are dependent on – on state-owned oil enterprises, and this is like Russia, OPEC. You're already seeing signs that it's that it's collapsing their business, their models. And um, I think this is a huge shift in global power in favor of the United States hmm. and U.S. energy independence, which has been achieved. And uh, you know, not you know, and it was achieved by accident because Obama was so hard on the oil companies; they started operating really smartly. And they got so smart that they actually made a massive breakthrough that nobody predicted, including me. And so like Russia and all these other countries and Venezuela, they were dictatorships that were based on on cheap, easy oil money. All of a sudden, now that it's plentiful and we no longer need them, it's a huge shift. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think that's a, a, a really, really big shift. The other, the other thing I've been predicting – is uh, for three years I've been predicting uh, uh, in the final months of the uh, Obama administration and a clash, uh, possible clash with the uh, uh, Chinese in the in the South China Sea, which has been making a lot of news in the last year and a half now. Mm. But I'm I'm predicting that some kind of uh, you know I'm thinking that they might punch the Japanese Navy in the nose mm. and uh, expect us to come in. But I think there's something that might happen there uh, before Obama leaves. So, so it'd be yeah. between Japan and China. Uh, and I, I did a story, World War Three in three years, and that was you know written two two and a half years ago. Yeah. And it wow. basically was that uh, rising tensions in the South China Sea and the danger to U.S. aircraft carriers. I'm very worried about that. Hmm. Uh, how that might happen, uh, <clears throat> not be, not by a direct attack by the Chinese, but because uh, certain treaty obligations put us in a funny position there. Yeah. What have we not talked about with independentlivingnews.com? Anything that we that's important that we left out? No, uh, not not really. I think you I think you I think you've covered pretty well what I what I'm what I'm about and what yeah. I do and uh, I I think uh, uh, I do think that that it it I think that I think that uh, I think I don't know. I, I think we covered it. Yeah. I, I just... uh, you know what I think? I think I'd love to see more videos online with you in them on your channel. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's just we me. started. Thank you. We're doing yeah. more of that. We're doing yeah. more. Of I that. saw I that. Have a lot of I fun watched with a few. It. Yeah. I, I like doing it, and it's fun making the predictions, yeah. and and yeah. it's uh, and and it's 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 kind of a way to tell people beyond just writing letter writing to them. I I do yeah. a lot of writing and. Uh, uh, it's it's kind of fun to get back in the habit of talking about body yeah, yeah. issues. So. Everyone needs to check out independentlivingnews.com and go to also the shop. It's really interesting what products 
you know, info products, information, and physical products. Lee, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll shoot you that email. Definitely. Yeah, I'm going to put the wife proposal in the post. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other.